fusion happens when you press two light elements really close together. As they get closer, the electrostatic force between the positively charged nuclei increases. Just like the force increases when you push two magnets together. While the range of the electrostatic force is infinite, there is another force called the strong nuclear force, which only acts at very small distances. This is a hundred times stronger than the electrostatic force. So, when the nuclei get close enough, the strong force kicks in and the lighter elements get bound together into a heavier element. Rutherford conducted this experiment in 1934. The lighter elements were both deuterium, an isotope of hydrogen. The heavier element was helium. But there was a catch. The weight of helium was already known. 4.0022 But the weight of the two deuterium atoms put together was 4.0272. It was discovered that this difference in mass was converted to energy according to Einstein's mass-energy equation and carried by a really fast neutron as well as an alpha particle. Almost every article or video about fusion refers to it as a clean, limitless source of energy. Which it is. Inside the Sun, the intense gravitational forces of our stellar companion are really good at confining the hydrogen plasma and condensing it so the nuclei are squeezed really close together. On Earth, it's a different matter. Even though we use hydrogen isotopes that are many orders of magnitude more reactive than vanilla hydrogen, we still need extreme temperatures to overcome the Coulombic barrier. How extreme? 100 million degrees. I try and put it in context, but there's really no point. Here's a meme instead. As you might expect, no material in the world can withstand such temperatures. So this deuterium tritium plasma has to be suspended in a vacuum with superconducting magnets and heated till we achieve ignition. The plasma undergoing enough deuterium-tritium fusions so that the energy of helium nuclei or alpha particles thus produced is enough to sustain the reaction. This is called magnetic confinement and will be used in ITER, which is considered the first step towards a commercial fusion reactor. There is another technique called inertial confinement, but its many setbacks and failures would probably require their own video. We've known about fusion for pretty much as long as we've known about fission. And yet, while it took around five years from the principles of fission being understood to a working reactor, it is now 80 years and counting and we're still waiting on fusion. Why exactly is that? It's not that fusion is hard. You can make a fusion reactor at home. Yes, really. But to make it happen in a way that you get net energy out has proven to be really difficult. When people talk about limitless fuel, they're mostly talking about deuterium, which is quite abundant. For all intents and purposes, infinite. But what about the other part of the equation, tritium? Well, we have a grand total of about 20 kgs in the whole world. It's made in pressurized heavy water reactors like the kind we have here in India. Kandu reactors. An annual worldwide production is around 2.5 kilograms. And just how much tritium do we require to run a basic 1 gigawatt fusion reactor for a year? 125 kgs. Look, it says so on ITER's website. Luckily, scientists have thought this through. When deuterium-tritium fusion occurs, most of the energy is carried off by a neutron. The containment vessel is surrounded by a blanket of lithium, which absorbs these neutrons and decays into tritium and an alpha particle. So tritium is constantly regenerated. But in practice, less than 10% of the tritium injected into the plasma will fuse in any given ignition cycle. This has to be recovered and fed back in 10 to 20 times for it to be used up. Even a 1% loss will mean that tritium cannot be replenished at a sufficient rate. And in tritium experiments in the joint European Taurus, 10% of tritium was never recovered. This does not bode well for ITER. This loss of tritium is due to the fact that it diffuses into the reactor walls and into the water that's used to carry heat away. This is a massive problem because regulators and environmentalists really don't like the idea of any radioactive material leaking out. There will have to be measures taken to prevent this, and presumably expensive ones because tritium gets everywhere. The second problem is neutrons, the fast-moving neutrons that carry most of the fusion energy. As they're electrically neutral, they're unaffected by the magnetic field and slam into the walls of the reactor vessels and lithium blanket, thereby heating them up. The constant bombardment by neutrons knocks atoms out of the metal lattice. 
This damages the reactor over time, creating fractures and making it brittle. The neutrons also make everything they touch radioactive, admittedly at low levels. But the problem of disposing of the material remains. The joint European Taurus, that was one-tenth the size of ITER, generated about 3,000 tons of radioactive waste. And it's estimated that it will cost 300 million US dollars to safely dispose of it. Due to this widespread radioactivity, maintenance work near the reactors cannot be carried out by humans. Some kind of remote or robotic maintenance will have to be worked out, adding to the expense. Yet another problem is magnets. They need to be superconductive in order to withstand the currents required, in turn to generate the intense magnetic fields needed for plasma confinement. But they can suddenly and unpredictably undergo a process called quenching, where they become resistant to current. This results in a huge buildup of heat and voltage and may cascade to other magnets too. While there are systems in place to detect this in ITER, any fusion plant will have to be built, keeping in mind that uncontrolled quenching may occur, which will mean additional safety features, which will mean more expenses. If the magnet suffers damage, it will have to be heated back up to room temperature, repaired, and then cooled back down to 4.5 Kelvin. This can take a long time, and the reactor won't be able to generate any electricity in this duration, lowering its capacity factor. You see these structures on the top and the bottom of the reactor? These are called diverters, and they remove the helium generated by fusion. But they don't hold up very well in extreme environments. Helium gas collects in the interstitial spaces, creating blisters. So yet another thing that needs expensive new material ought to be regularly replaced. But let's assume that we overcome all these technical challenges somehow. Superconducting magnets no longer quench, the reactor vessel no longer becomes damaged and radioactive, we are able to make enough tritium to offset any losses and we come up with some exotic material to make diverters. Even then, there is this whole issue of parasitic power drain. The cryostats run on liquid helium. You need a lot of electricity just to maintain it at 4.5 Kelvin. Then there is a vacuum that you have to maintain inside the reactor and water that you have to pump to carry away the heat from the vacuum vessel and blanket. This is when fusion is not even happening and you're already consuming about 100 megawatts just to keep things running. Once the fusion starts, you need a lot more. Around 2 to 300 watts to heat up the plasma and turn on the magnetic confinement. The 500 megawatts you heard that ITER will produce is not exactly misleading, just misunderstood. That's the thermal power it will generate. Converting to electricity at 40% efficiency will yield 200 megawatts, which is way less than the plant's requirement of 300 to 400 megawatts. That's why they didn't see fit to even try and generate electricity off this. The ITER will begin plasma experimentation with hydrogen and helium in 2027 and start fusing deuterium and tritium in 2035, attempting to produce energy. Again, this is thermal power. ITER will not be blessed by the turbine fairy. That honor will be reserved for the demonstration reactor, a 2 gigawatt project that will come online in the 2040s and actually produce electricity. But it will optimistically take at least till the 2060s till some kind of commercial implementation is ready. Here's the thing. Even if the technology was ready today, even if we had done all the experiments, figured all the problems out, it would still not be viable for widespread electricity production. Why? Because it would be far too expensive. Let's put this in perspective. Fission, which is a much simpler process and has been around for the last 60 years, is still too expensive for most companies and countries. If fusion, a power production method that has a far larger reactor, depends on special materials, superconducting magnets, cryosystems and vacuum vessels somehow manages to be about the same cost as a fission plant, then great. But it doesn't sound too likely, does it? And even fission plants are not getting built anymore because they're considered too expensive. Barring India and China, most countries are moving away from fission energy. Even the biggest argument in favor of fusion doesn't really fly. Sure, it can't undergo a runaway chain reaction. But on the other hand, you have super hot plasma with hydrogen isotopes traveling around a toroid at near luminal speeds. Okay, I used a lot of sciencey words to make it sound scary. I plead guilty. 
but there is a risk of explosion and dispersal of radioactive material if the plasma containment fails or if the magnets undergo violent quenching. As long as there is a non-zero risk of this happening, regulators will require fail-safes. A steel-reinforced concrete containment building could probably keep that material inside, but that puts an end to another one of the main pitches of fusion proponents. That fusion plants won't require the amount of safety protocols that fission plants do. I'm not saying that these are insurmountable problems. Of course not. But in this way, it's not very different from fission reactors, which, let me remind you, have already been operational for 60 years, at their peak, providing 70% of France's energy requirements. But let me change course a little bit. The total investment in fusion was quite substantial last year. But as these things go, it's just a drop in the bucket. My suggestion, if you're really interested in fusion, think of this as a spectacular science experiment. Something like the Large Hadron Collider, where we are more interested in physics experiments and their outcomes, as opposed to something practical. Lots of countries have put forward plans to move to a zero emissions economy between 2050 and 2070, and many other will follow suit. So by the time fusion becomes technologically and economically viable, the problem it is trying to solve will likely no longer exist. The price of renewables is plummeting far faster than anyone anticipated. And the problem of intermittency can be addressed by battery and hydrogen storage. There will still be a gap. And if we decide to go for a carbon neutral source, it will possibly be bridged by nuclear fission. And people who care about the environment and climate change will hopefully make peace with that. Maybe, just maybe towards the end of the century, fission plants will begin to be phased out in favor of fusion. But it's probably not something you should bet on, at least based on our current understanding. Most of the information in this video came from an article by Daniel Jasby, a Princeton plasma physicist and possible Stanley character who worked on fusion for 25 years. I didn't include some of his arguments pertaining to nuclear proliferation because I didn't feel that they were valid. So if you want to go over all his objections, the link is in the description below. But if you don't end up reading it, here's his last paragraph. The harsh realities of fusion belie the claims of its proponents of unlimited, clean, safe and cheap energy. Terrestrial fusion energy is not the ideal energy source extolled by its boosters, but to the contrary, it's something to be shunned. I hope you guys really enjoyed this video. Like, share, subscribe and start a conversation below to get more videos like this in your recommendations. I'll see you really soon. Bye.